Hello physics people, uh, this is Mrs Jones. Uh, welcome to my lesson on vector diagrams. Uh, this appears in topic 9 if you're doing triple science and in topic 8 if you are doing combined science. Um, so what I would ask you to do to start with is to have a think about what forces might be acting on this plane as it comes into land. Uh, as you can see the pilot seems to be having some trouble uh, landing this plane straight on the runway um, could be due to some severe crosswinds or could just be a really terrible pilot. You might want to have a think about how we would represent these forces in a diagram and what kind of conventions we would uh, use. Something we uh, did way back in topic two when we looked at Newton's laws, forces. Um, the background knowledge you need for this lesson is uh, mainly going to be at Newton's first law. Um, so have a think, maybe even make a list and see uh, what you can come up with. The ideas you might have thought of, uh, we've got the obvious weight of the plane um, and uh, everything in the plane, including the holiday luggage, which you might not want to be thinking about uh, during these lockdown times. Uh, you might have thought of the thrust from the engine, uh, possibly the air resistance uh, while the plane's in the air, uh, and also the other frictional forces when it comes into land between the wheels and the runway. Um, you might have thought of the uh, lift provided by the wings, um, and maybe even this, uh, this crosswind uh, could be uh, causing the plane to experience a force. I'm um, not sure if you came up with, with anything else, but uh, these are the main things that you might have thought of. So, if I was teaching this lesson to you in school, I would normally split this into two lessons. Um, because the method that we use uh, to work out the answers to these vector diagram questions is to draw scale diagrams, and they normally take quite a bit of time to practice uh, getting them right. Um, so normally what I would do in the first lesson is look at, first of all, working out the resultant force uh, on an object when forces are acting not necessarily in opposite or the same directions. Um, and in the second lesson, I would normally go on to um, resolving forces where we find the component forces uh, from one overall resultant force. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, looking at resultant force um, and first of all just build on what we have already looked at way back in topic two uh, when we looked at Newton's laws. The background knowledge that you need uh, for this lesson really revolves around um, Newton's first law. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is, is recap that and then uh, work on building uh, on that knowledge uh, to help us solve these slightly more difficult, uh, complicated questions. So this first question just recaps the work we did uh, on Newton's first law uh, back in topic two. Um, it says uh, that the car is slowing down. Uh, so that is classed as an acceleration. So for Newton's first law, uh, an object uh, remains at a constant speed or a constant velocity, um, provided that no resultant force acts on it. If a resultant force does act on it, then it will accelerate. So in this case, uh, the resultant force um, is going to be acting in the opposite direction to the way that the car is moving because it is uh, slowing down. So it's going to cause a deceleration. Um, so here we have a resultant force that has a, a value that is not zero um, and it's going to be acting um, against the direction of motion to slow the car down. Um, so that's just a bit of a recap. Um, same with question two, uh, looking at uh, the force diagram or the free body diagram to represent the, this aeroplane uh, that's in flight. Um, so it might look something like this where we've got um, an arrow to represent the thrust and the drag, and then one to represent the lift which opposes the weight. Uh, so here, as you can see, we've got um, pairs of opposing forces. Um, so if we wanted to work out the resultant force, um, then we would be able to do the thrust force, take away the uh, drag force, and that would give us the overall resultant force um, to say whether the plane's going to accelerate forwards, whether it's going to decelerate or whether it's going to be moving at a constant speed. 
Um, but in this lesson, we want to build on this idea, uh, but look at what we can do to work out resultant force when the forces aren't acting in opposite directions to each other. So here we've got the thrust and the drag are acting opposite to each other and the lift and the weight. But if we wanted to include the force uh, caused by a crosswind, it might be that the crosswind is coming from this direction, which doesn't really oppose any of the forces. Um, on this diagram uh, so we can't just simply take it away because it's not acting on the same plane so in this lesson uh, we're going to have a look at how we would deal with uh, forces that aren't acting in opposite directions to each other okay so here's the first question uh, and it's about uh, two dogs that are pulling uh, on a sled uh, on some snow um, and it tells you in the question that each of the ropes um, is at a 30 degree angle to the way that the sled is moving and um, it also tells you that the dogs are each pulling with a force of 60 newtons so same angle and same force just to keep it simple to start with um, so what we need to do first is get a starting point so the ropes are attached here to the sled so if we start off uh, just with a little box to represent our sled uh, and our starting point will be here at the front of the sled. Um, so the first thing you've got to do is uh, measure the angle um, to work out which direction the force um, is actually going to be acting in. So the first thing that you would do is you would use a protractor um, to measure the angle here and make a little mark um, on the protractor where 30 degrees is. Then you would need to use a ruler uh, to draw this line. Now, these lines that represent the forces have got to be to scale uh, for this to work. So a sensible scale to use in, on this occasion will be to use one centimetre for every 10 newtons. Um, so that would then uh, enable us to draw a line that is six centimetres long to represent our 60 newtons. Um, and obviously the same on the other side, because in the question it tells you uh, both the same and uh, you would then draw a line to represent the 60 newtons that was six centimetres long. So it's really important that you measure the angle accurately with your protractor and also the length of your arrow uh, accurately because if you make little mistakes here and little errors, they can all add together and then when you finally calculate your resultant force, it, uh, it might not be accurate and it might not be within the range that the examiner uh, wants to see. So with all questions like this uh, where there's measuring to do, um, you will always be allowed a margin of error but um, the, the range that you will be allowed um, is usually quite small so it's really really important to be as accurate as possible when you measure the angles and then of course uh, when you draw your um, forces that are being exerted in this case uh, from the two dogs. The next step um, in this question is to work out the resultant force. Uh, so to do that, what we need to do here is to um, draw parallel lines um, that are parallel, not to each other, but parallel to the um, force arrows that we've already uh, put in place here. Uh, so what we want to do is have a line that's parallel to uh, this force line here that goes across the end of uh, the other force line. So we want a line that goes along here and then we want a, another parallel line parallel to this arrow at the end of our other arrow. Um, so when we do that, uh, when we draw those in, they will meet. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're making it into a parallelogram. So where these two lines meet, uh, that's going to give you uh, your resultant force um, and the direction of the resultant force. So you can see the directions in the middle uh, or straight down the middle here in this case. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to draw a line uh, from our starting point um, to the point where the uh, parallel lines cross. So uh, once we've done that, we can uh, measure that using a ruler and we can use the same scale um, that we started with one centimeter for every 10 newtons 
Um, so in this case, this line would be uh, 10.4 centimetres uh, and converted back into newtons. Um, that gives us um, our resultant force of 104 newtons. So the length of the arrow uh, that joins the starting uh, and ending points of our parallelogram that we've drawn uh, will give us our uh, resultant force, provided that it's drawn accurately and provided that you use uh, the same scale that you started with. So in the next part of the lesson, uh, we would have uh, a couple of examples to do, uh, just to give you a bit of practice on um, doing these force diagrams. Um, so for question one, it wants you to set it up in this format here, and it gives you uh, different values for the two forces, A and B, and then different values for uh, the angles. Uh, so I would go about this uh, by drawing a line, first of all, um, for force A, uh, which needs to be representing 50 newtons. So what we need to do here, probably use the same scale that we used in the previous question, a sensible scale of one centimetre for every 10 newtons. Um, so what we would then do is we would uh, draw a line to represent force A. So this line will be a straight line drawn with a ruler uh, that was five centimetres long, uh, not drawn freehand as I have uh, got to do here, not using a ruler. Um, so that would represent force A. The second step uh, would be to uh, put our angle in. So we would need to use a protractor. Well, you might not need to use it for 90 degrees, but you would for these others. A uh, protractor to measure 90 degrees, which is, of course, a right angle. Um, and then at 90 degrees, we would draw force B, which is 25 newtons. So that would need to be 2.5 centimetres long. And um, that is our force B. So that's the first part. Uh, then what we need to do is we need to draw our parallelogram. So we would use a parallel line um, that's parallel to force B at the end of arrow A. So there's my lovely straight parallel line. Um, and then again, a, for, uh, a line that's parallel to force A at the end of arrow B. So once we've done that, uh, we've got our parallel lines are crossing and uh, we can draw in our resultant force so from the starting point to the point which the arrows cross nice straight line there um, and that would be our resultant force there so then we would take our ruler and we would measure that very straight line um, and use the same scale that we originally started with um, so if you were to do this uh, nice and accurately, uh, you should get um, a line that represents 56 newtons. Um, so that would be a line that would be 5 centimetres long, 5.6 uh, centimetres long uh, to represent uh, 56 newtons. Uh, so if you did it accurately, that's what you should get. If um, you make a little mistake, it's not usually too much of a problem uh, because the exam board will allow a range for this answer. So they might say, well, we're going to include um, 55 newtons and 57 newtons. So they'll give you a, a range for that uh, possible error that could have occurred. Uh, but the range usually isn't a massive range, so it's important to, um, to keep accurate uh, when you're drawing these diagrams, as previously mentioned. To do uh, options B and C, we would uh, do a, go through exactly the same uh, process, but with an angle of 60 degrees. So you would need to use protractor to measure the angle here at 60 degrees. Uh, line A would be 10 centimetres and line B would be 4 centimetres. So you would get a slightly different result. Um, and again, you'd be allowed a range, but you should be somewhere in the region of 126 newtons and uh, 68 newtons for C. Uh, so if you've done those, I know you've got the answers as well that you could check um, with what I've already sent through, uh, but those are the answers that you should get. For question two, uh, we're not working in newtons, we're working in kilonewtons. Um, so you would have to adopt a different scale for these two questions because we're dealing with forces that are much larger. But you can just use exactly the same principle um, as before. Uh, just choose a suitable scale that's going to fit on your onto your page. Um, in these two examples, the um, starting forces are already given and it's already set up for you. So all you would actually have to do um, on these questions would be to uh, make the parallelogram and um, then draw a line or you don't even need to draw a line. You can just measure it with, with a ruler 
um, your resultant force here and then convert it back to kilonewtons from uh, centimetres from whatever scale you have used. Um, so it's as simple as that really. The question that I've seen uh, in the previous exam was a little bit like this one uh, where you had to draw the parallelogram and um, show the resultant force. You didn't actually have to measure any angles or set up any force lines but who knows what they're going to throw into the exams in future. With this one I haven't really got enough room on screen to, um, to show you but you would do the same thing. You would draw um, a parallel line at the end of um, this 10 kilonewton force that's parallel with the 40 kilonewton force, so that would be a straight line, um, and then you would need to do a parallel line at the end of the 40 kilonewton um, that's parallel to this 10 kilonewton, which obviously would go off screen, uh, but then where those two lines meet, that would give you your <laughs> resultant force, obviously that would be a straight line, and you would be doing that with a ruler. Um, so if you were to um, attempt these two you can if you've not already done so you can pause the video have a go uh, and then come back for the answers or you can look at what was sent through um, but for part a you would get 21 kilonewtons so the range for that would be uh, let's say they would allow anything from 19 up to 22 or 23 so they'd give you a bit of a range it doesn't have to be exactly bang on but it needs to be pretty close and then for B um, 48 kilonewtons so probably two new kilonewtons each way um, so anything between 46 and 50 uh, kilonewtons for your answer uh, would would be acceptable okay so here's the question from the textbook uh, you will have seen this if you have done the uh, textbook questions um, and what it's telling us here is that uh, we have got uh, a plane coming into land as per usual and um, it has uh, a 50 kilonewton force from the engine that it tells you here as well uh, so you would need to draw uh, a line here in the direction that the plane is pointing to scale the scale they've used here is uh, one centimeter for every five kilonewtons um, so uh, you would need to use that scale to uh, draw your arrow here of 50 kilonewtons um, so we would want um, that line to be uh, drawn to this scale uh, so once you've done that you would use a protractor to measure the angle of the wind so it tells you that the force from the wind here is 15 kilonewtons and angle of 150 so if you would have your protractor set up so zero degrees was lying on the um, force from the engine line then you would measure 150 degrees make a little mark here and then draw your um, three centimeter line here to represent your 15 kilonewton force um, once you've done that you can then construct your parallelogram so a line parallel to the engine force um, line and a line parallel to the wind force here um, so once you've constructed your parallelogram you can join the starting point to the ending point here with a line or you can just measure it with a ruler you don't need to draw a line particularly um, and that would be your resultant force um, so in this case it looks like the plane will uh, end up landing nice and straight on the runway and um, it looks to be uh, about 37 kilonewtons of force for the uh, final overall uh, resultant force if you were to uh, to measure it with a ruler okay so here's a slightly uh, more uh, difficult uh, question slightly more complicated one because uh, we've got two people this was the best picture I could get to match uh, the uh, context here that the question's given in so we've got two people are lifting a weight um, with two ropes uh, so person a um, is pulling with a force of 100 newtons and uh, her rope is at an angle of 10 degrees obviously it's not exactly perfect but the diagram will be uh, and person b um, is uh, pulling with a force of 80 newtons um, at an angle of 25 to the vertical so what we need to do is we need to get our starting point um, with a nice dotted vertical line, a bit like a normal line there, uh, so we can measure our angles. Uh, and the first step is always going to be to measure the angles so you get the correct direction for the forces. So first job is to measure angles. So we've got person A on this side here 
um, is uh, at 10 degrees and then person B is at um, 25 degrees. Uh, so this here is person A uh, and this here is person B. Okie dokie. Uh, so once that's been done, we can then uh, use the scale. So again, one centimetre for 10 newtons would be uh, okay for this. Uh, and we would draw our lines. So we've got one 10 centimetre line here and an 8 centimetre line here to represent our forces of 100 and um, our force of 80 newtons. So that's now set up. Uh, we go through exactly the same steps um, and we draw our parallelogram. So uh, what we need here is a parallel line um, or a line that's parallel at the end of each force arrow um, and the line will be parallel to the to the other force. Um, so what we've got here is uh, our parallel line at the end of our 80 newton line that's parallel to the 100. So these two lines are parallel. Um, and then the second line here um, is parallel to the 80 newton uh, arrow uh, and then of course they meet at the top so when they meet at the top we can join our starting point to our end point and we can measure the length of this line so if we measure the length of this line uh, we end up with 17.2 centimeters um, and that will then give us a final overall resultant force on the weight of 172 newtons to look after it Okay, so at this point we have um, used the scale diagrams to work out resultant forces um, and forces where uh, they are not acting opposite or in the same direction to each other uh, and what would we end up with. Um, the second lesson I would normally do on this would be kind of working backwards um, on resolving forces and finding the components um, of a resultant force. Uh, so. I would normally do this in the second lesson just to allow you to um, get to grips with it and uh, have lots of practice. But I actually think that this uh, resolving forces is a little bit easier than uh, finding the resultant force. So um, hopefully uh, you will uh, not have too much trouble with this one. OK, so here we are with our absolutely brand new context of planes, uh, but we're taking off this time. We're not landing, so a uh, slightly different idea. Uh, we've got this uh, photograph um, of this lovely fast jet taking off just to uh, give us uh, give us our context. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen any of the military planes that have been uh, flying over Manchester in recent weeks. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the Globemaster uh, flying over, doing some touchdown landings at Manchester, which was amazing to see um, that going over the house. Um, yesterday, we had the Hercules doing a few touchdowns at Manchester. I've seen a couple of red arrows. Uh, so I'm just waiting for the Eurofighters to get here, really. Uh, but um, I'm not going to hold my breath because they seem to be hanging around uh, Wales and Anglesey and uh, not really making their way over to Manchester. So uh, that's a bit disappointing, but something we can uh, we can hope for. So uh, if you are on the flight path, uh, keep an eye out for some of these um, exciting uh, military planes that have been uh, making an appearance over the last few weeks. Um, so here what we're doing is we're being given um, a force. So in this case, we've got the force from the engine uh, and a direction. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to find um, the horizontal and the vertical components um, of this force. So um, the horizontal component is how much of the force is pushing forwards and um, the vertical is how much uh, of the force is pushing upwards. Um, so we're finding uh, those the size of those two forces uh, when we are given the direction and the size uh, of the force from the engines. So what I would normally do um, in the lesson is I would give you uh, this set of instructions. So um, I would say, OK, here's the here's the question. We've got an angle of uh, 30 degrees to the ground for the force. So this angle here is 30 degrees um, to the horizontal um, and we've got the engine providing a force of 200 kilonewtons. So you need to use a scale diagram um, as we did in the previous lesson. 
um, and see if you can find out as close as possible uh, the horizontal and the vertical um, components to this force. So if you've not done it already, uh, what you can do is uh, pause the video and have a go at this question and see um, what you can come up with uh, before, we, um, before we look at the answers. OK, so if you've had a go at this, hopefully your uh, answer might look something uh, close to this. Uh, so what we've got um, is, first of all, selecting a scale. Uh, the scale they've used here is uh, 1 centimetre to 20 kilonewtons. And what we want to do is we want to show the thrust force of 200 kilonewtons. So what we would do is we would draw a line that is uh, 10 centimetres long um, at an angle of 30 degrees to to the ground. Um, I think when I did it first time I used a, a slightly larger scale. I went for um, one square for ten and did my line to 20 centimeters uh, but it doesn't matter as long as you um, as long as you stick to the same scale uh, throughout. Um, so once you've measured your 30 degrees you can draw your uh, line to represent your 200 kilonewtons and then um, once you've done that, um, you can uh, draw a rectangle. So you drop a vertical line down and a horizontal line across. To be honest, you probably only really need this one because you can then measure the length of this line, which is equal to the length um, of the line at the top. So measuring the length of this vertical line uh, will give you your vertical component. So um, when you measure this, uh, it should work out on your scale, whichever you've used, uh, to be about around about 100 kilonewtons. And then the length of this line is our, as it says here, horizontal component, uh, should be around 173. Uh, as with all these types of questions, you will be allowed um, a little bit of error, uh, but you need to be uh, working something around uh, that's close to uh, close to that. So as long as you've done your angle accurately and the length of your line accurately, um, it should uh, work out pretty well. Um, the other question, uh, the challenge question, was doing the same thing, uh, but instead of an angle of 30 degrees, um, we're looking at an angle of 50 degrees. So you do exactly the same here, but instead of 30 degrees here, you would have a, a slightly steeper angle of 50 degrees. Um, and if you had a go at that, then uh, the answer should come up around about 153 for the vertical component and 129 uh, for the horizontal component. So uh, because the angle is uh, steeper, the vertical component is larger um, in this second example. So uh, you could also have a go at that if you need a bit of practice. Um, set your angle at 50 degrees um, and see how close you can actually get uh, to these answers for vertical and horizontal components. In contrast to that here, we've got uh, a question that's just asking you to describe the horizontal and vertical components and compare them. Um, if the plane was climbing at a much more shallow angle. Um, so it's the opposite uh, of the previous, really. If, um, if it was at a more shallow angle than the original question, uh, the horizontal component would be larger than the 173 from the first question, um, and the vertical component would be smaller. Uh, so just thinking about how uh, the angle uh, will affect um, how big the horizontal and vertical components are. So uh, that one's pretty straightforward. OK, so here are um, a couple more examples, which was uh, on the PowerPoint that I sent out uh, for you to have a go at. So if you've not already had a go at them, you could pause the video and uh, see what you can come up with um, before you uh, watch the rest of this. And um, the contexts are really similar. Um, we've got a skier and a child sliding down a slide. So basically it's the same thing. Uh, we've got the weight um, is the force that we're given to work with. Um, and we want to know how much of that um, is uh, pushing uh, the person down the slope um, and how much of that force is uh, pressing against the slope. So in this example, um, it's telling us that the slope is at 20 degrees 
um, from the horizontal. So if we were to uh, draw a horizontal line across, then the angle of the slope that the skier is on um, would be 20 degrees. Uh, so what we would need to do is set it up in a diagram as we've done previously and um, we would need to use a scale to represent the uh, 800 newtons. So uh, the best way to do this would be again to draw uh, the scale diagram and choose a scale that makes sense. Uh, so one centimetre for 100 newtons, therefore this line would be um, eight centimetres. The weight line would be vertical because it would press uh, towards the center of gravity um, and that would represent the the person's weight um, and then once you've done that as you did in the previous question um, you draw two lines that are right angles to each other um, so as we said before um, the angle of the slope is uh, 20 degrees um, so one of our lines would go um, at right angles to the slope um, and then the other one would point uh, straight down the slope. So these are the two um, lines that we are interested in uh, measuring. Um, it says here that you uh, would also draw a rectangle. I don't feel that you would need to do that because um, you could just measure this line and this line you wouldn't necessarily need uh, need the rest of it. Um, but it's up to you. You can uh, make it into a rectangle. So your diagram um, might look uh, a little something like this when you've drawn it. So we've got um, our weight arrow which points directly downwards towards the centre of gravity. Um, and then our lines at right angles. So um, where this uh, line here on the left hits the slope, uh, we would then measure that line with a ruler uh, and use the same scale. So this is eight centimetres that we originally drew. Uh, here we would measure this to be about 7.5 centimetres. Um, again, like I said, uh, you don't have to draw the full rectangle, but you can if you want, because this line is the same length as this line. And when you measure it, it should work out about um, 2.7. So that would give us um, a force of 270 newtons uh, pointing down the slope and 750 newtons um, that is pressing the skier into the slope. Um, so again there would be a range uh, given in a mark scheme for any question like this but it won't be a very large range. It will be um, a small range to allow for a small margin of error but uh, uh, nothing too big. So just make sure that you are measuring angles and um, measuring and drawing force lines um, accurately to, uh, to your scale. Um, the last question, again, it was really, really similar to the previous question, um, but the context here is a child um, sliding down a slide. Um, and it's telling us that the slide um, is making an angle of 40, um, 40 degrees here. So this angle um, is 40 degrees uh, rather than 20 degrees as it was in the previous question. Um, and the child has a, a smaller weight here of um, 250 newtons. So the weight arrow again would point straight down um, but would need to uh, represent 250 newtons and not uh, 800 as it was in previous. So um, weight always goes vertically downwards and then we've got um, the slide at an angle of 40 degrees. So we need to use a retractor to measure that 40 degrees um, and uh, join it to the, uh, the top of the line there. It doesn't matter how far down you go here on this one. Um, so when we draw our rectangle, what we can do then is we can um, measure either really but we can measure uh, the length of this line here uh, which will give us the amount of force that's taking the child down the slide and then the length of this arrow uh, which is the amount of force that's pushing back um, into the actual slide. Um, so if you were to measure this um, using whatever scale you've used uh, you can just use the same scale um, you could use 2.5 centimeters here this would be 1.6 um, and that would be uh, 1.92. Uh, so again, you would get uh, definitely for that um, a range of answers that uh, would be allowable.
Um, so once you've measured these lines using the same scale, um, you've got your uh, two component forces. Um, here it's saying find out how much of the child's weight is pulling them down the slide. So the answer to this particular question is 160 newtons. Um, so start with um, start with measuring the angles as with any of these questions. Uh, and once you've got your angle accurate, you can um, you can add in these force lines. So uh, that's the end of the lesson on vector diagrams. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you find it found it helpful. Uh, like I said, it would normally take me two lessons to uh, cover this material, hence the, the longer video. Um, but hopefully there'll be uh, more to come on the uh, Pre-Snall Science Hub. Uh, if you um, have a look on there, you should be able to find videos from uh, Mr. Clary and Mr. Burp. So uh, keep your keep your eyes peeled. For those, uh, maybe subscribe to uh, the Personal Science Hub, and there should be more to come um, as we uh, as we put them together. Hope everyone's all uh, happy, well, safe in lockdown, and keep an eye out for those military planes because uh, they are great to see. Goodbye.